wonderful having you here today. We we really appreciate your time and Thank and you. uh, hearing from you. So let me um, uh, go ahead and introduce you. Although I don't think you need a lot of introduction, quite frankly, but. Um, I think most people know that, that Mary uh, is an attorney by training and um, uh, has a very uh, long and illustrious history in applying the law and developing policy and regulations for air quality and climate change. Um, as an indicator of her future career, uh, not long after she graduated from Yale, she was an attorney for the Center for Law and the Public Interest and immediately sued the EPA uh, to force them to uh, establish plans for the health-based standards if states didn't do it. That was a successful lawsuit and that really set off a, a long career that's had a huge impact on our air quality and climate. Um, she has been chair of the California Resources Board several times from 1975 to 1982 and then uh, most recently from 2007 to 2019. For those of you who have been here uh, as many years as I have, uh, you may remember when, when Bob Hope had described um, the air in Southern California as uh, if he couldn't chew it, he didn't trust it. And uh, that's the way it was back in the 70s. And uh, um, it's really been largely under Mary's leadership that we now have the, the clear skies that we have today. Of course, we've still got some more to go, but it's been an amazing, amazing change. Uh, she was assistant administrator in charge of the Office of Air and Radiation at the US EPA and the Clinton administration. Um, and she was secretary, um, California Resources Agency secretary, which involves 27 uh, departments, boards, and commissions and conservancies. Uh, long history in leading non-governmental organizations, for example, executive director of the Environment Now Foundation. And um, she is Professor Mary Nichols. She was um, director of the Environment Institute at UCLA, uh, Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at a critical time and really as I understand it from my colleagues there, brought it back from, from death's door, which continues to be uh, appreciated. Um, she, uh, she led the development of programs to address air pollution uh, problems in disadvantaged communities. It was under her watch uh, that California developed this AB 617, uh, which has identified a number of environmental justice communities and set up committees to work with them to um, address their air pollution problems. Uh, and, um, and since the 1970s, um, California's had the authority to set its own air quality standards. Uh, and in the previous administration, um, that was wiped out as well as the, the uh, mileage standards to address climate change. Uh, but I think a real testament to Mary and how she can work across um, so many boundaries and with everybody basically um, four of the major car manufacturers made an agreement with the Air Resources Board to follow those uh, climate um, uh, standards, the mileage standards, with, with just a very small delay. And that represented about 30% of the car market in the US. And now, thankfully, that's back in place. Um, Time Magazine described her as one of the most 100 uh, influential people in the world in 2013. And um, and Nature did an article on her titled uh, America's Top Climate uh, Cop. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences um, uh, a couple of years ago for, um, for the impact she's had. So as I think many people here recognize, Cal what California does tends to be emulated nationally and internationally if it's successful. And that's exactly what's happened with um, the air quality and climate regulations. Uh, and, and with the air quality issue, we know it was causing a lot of excess deaths. And so there's a lot of avoided deaths as well as other costs that, that really, I think Mary can take uh, a great deal of credit for. Uh, so with that, um, let me turn it over to Mary. She's got this absolute wealth of experience in how you actually take the kinds of science and technology we do and actually make it work in policy. Uh, and as I told her, um, I consider myself a naive academic, and <laughs> I think a lot of us do, and so we can do all the science and technology we like, and it's uh, necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for actually uh, making a change in the world. So um, Mary's the one who knows how to make that happen, and with that, let me turn it over to you, Mary. Well, uh, thank you for that incredibly generous introduction, Barbara, um, and while I, uh, I, I am happy to take credit for things that California has accomplished, 
over the period that I've been working here uh, with many, many other people, starting with the governors who appointed me to be on the Air Resources Board. I think it's important to say that um, none of this stuff happened in a vacuum. And uh, I will draw on my experience from UCLA in the sense that um, you know, I, I worked with a, an organization called the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, uh, which had been started uh, five or more years before I got there uh, with a lot of support from the then uh, vice chancellor for research, uh, who was a very distinguished sort of public academic, um, Charlie Kennel. I don't know if you know him or remember him, but he was the president of the California Academy of Sciences and was, uh, he came to UCLA briefly from a career mostly spent at UC San Diego. And um, he uh, is a scientist and a researcher and an academic administrator. Uh, but his um, mission in helping to get this institute started was to try to mobilize faculty across disciplinary lines to work on critical issues of sustainability, um, foremost among which, of course, is the issue of climate change. And he had uh, a large number of faculty members from across the campus who were very interested in being a part of this and who all had expertise in various very relevant topics. Um, and were frustrated, as uh, you've sort of indicated, because with all the work that they had done and the strong views that they held, um, and the fact that they had succeeded in, you know, inculcating uh, at least a generation or two worth of students with a lot of the ideas and information that they had and launched a um, new generation of graduate students and postdocs, et cetera, in the field, um, they still weren't getting anything like the kind of traction that they would have liked to see in the public arena. And so, you know, the, the atmosphere really ranged from sort of slightly discouraged to downright desperate on the part of some of my colleagues. And all of them, to a man and woman, uh, believed that it was just a matter of politics. And you would say it's just a matter of politics. And that if only the politicians would listen, then things would could be accomplished. And yet, I would have to say, um, and this is you know criticism, but it's meant with affection, um, that they tended to assume when we would talk about how to expand the work of the Institute or what kind of um, expertise we should be seeking, what kinds of things we should be raising money for. Um, they never really gave a lot of credence to the idea that we should be hiring people whose expertise was in communications or in, um, uh, in organizing or uh, labor relations or uh, political science even. Um, all, all of the fields that are sort of um, intended to be a, a result, a, intended to be devoted to uh, this question of how do you take ideas and and turn them into into policy. So um, I am going to assume that everybody who's participating in today's conversation um, sort of uh, believes that there's an important job to be done there, uh, but somehow think that there's a button you could push or a secret that you could learn that would enable that to happen. And I am sadly here to say that um, this stuff is really complicated and hard and it takes a long time, but then every once in a while something happens and you think, oh my goodness, this is really simple. You know, it's almost miraculous that it got done. And then when you look back, maybe many years later, you realize that uh, in fact, it took a lot longer and was harder than it looked when you when you are gazing backwards. So let me use the example that, that Barbara likes to give and she has uh, played her own role in all of this, which is the establishment of California's air pollution uh, program, which not only has achieved um, measurable 
important results in the area of cleaning up the air and improving public health, which we can now demonstrate with actual uh, studies, field studies, as well as clinical studies that show actual benefits to humans from having taken pollutants out of the air. Um, but this did not happen all that quickly. Um, I came on the scene right after I graduated from law school in 1971. The Air Resources Board, uh, which was where I spent most of my uh, working years in this area, um, had been established in uh, the late 1960s. And that was after you know smog itself had become a public issue and uh, something that uh, politicians were being told they should do something about, you know, really going back to the 1950s, late 40s, 1950s, right after the Second World War, because um, during wartime was when the California experienced its then, you know, biggest uh, pollution and, and population boom uh, at the same time as a result of the war effort. And, um, you know, by the time I came on the scene, uh, one of the largest facilities in Southern California that was contributing very disproportionately to uh, bad air quality was a, a steel mill, uh, basic steel facility, which had been built out in the um, Eastern uh, end of the LA basin. Uh, and it had been built with government support and funding to produce, uh, produce tanks and, and weaponry uh, to, to fight the war. And in, in fact, many of the uh, pollution uh, issues that we face to this day, including groundwater under the, uh, under the uh, whole Southern California basin that's polluted um, stems from, from that period when um, even if people had known how bad some of the impacts were gonna be, uh, they wouldn't have hesitated to do what they did because they believed that that was what you had to do to, uh, to win the war and to, and to win it fast. So um, that obviously uh, overrode the concerns about future harm to health. It's also true that in those days uh, and uh, over time, we've learned so much more about this, um, there was a general belief, even on the part of well-educated people, that a little bit of pollution wouldn't harm you all that much. And anyhow, um, it was worth it because it was a sacrifice you had to make for advancing civilization. Nowadays, I would say that you know opinion has swung perhaps almost to the opposite extreme with um, increasing evidence that even at almost literally almost unmeasurable levels, um, air pollution can be linked to various adverse effects in human beings. I think you've frozen, Mary. Um. I think your your internet has crashed. Uh, um, you say things to me in the yeah. background. I can Sorry. almost never hear you. Um, the Wi-Fi. Yeah, your your internet crashed there for a minute. Yes. Are you back? Is that my back? So we, we can, can you hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you. Okay, let's try and see if I can get a picture gotcha. back. Yes. Gotcha. A picture uh -huh. too. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what happened. There's work going on in my neighborhood. So we could blame it on the Department of Water and Power. So um, I was just saying that, you know, we, the public opinion has moved greatly in the last decades to the point where, you know, people are not willing to accept much of anything in the way of new sources of pollution, no matter what the excuse or the need may seem to be. And 
that's okay. I'm not. I'm not uh, judging that at all. In fact, I think it's a it's a good sign as overall for the state of our civilization. But it does complicate the the politics of these issues because um, you know politicians tend to uh, have to balance uh, the desire of the public for clean air along with other things that they they know they are being judged on whether they can deliver as well. So learning enough and being able to communicate well for them becomes a, a big challenge when they're in decision-making roles where they have to make choices about um, economic development versus um, other, other benefits as well. So um, I, I think I really didn't wanna give a long uh, a lecture here today, but I would just say a couple of kind of basic things about what I think the tools are that we need to learn to use better uh, all of us, and then open it up, I hope, to questions which I, I believe uh, Barbara will, will uh, uh, moderate for us. So um, in terms of how people whose interests and, um, and uh, occupational focus, you know, is in the area of science, uh, technology, um, by definition, you all are on the front line of, um, how uh, the approach to dealing with the problem of climate change to just focus on that one sort of overriding issue is going to be addressed because anything you do that um, touches in any way on the solutions or the causes of the um, effects that we're experiencing um, is going to be relevant to the decision making that's uh, that needs to be made but how you get to communicate that to people who are in a position to do something about it and, and convey a sense of uh, not only the urgency of the problem, but also the um, possible ways of solving it, it requires a bunch of different kinds of tools and um, institutions to, um, to intervene to make change happen. And I would start by saying that um, in general, you know, the university uh, tends to not be as good as it should be. Even a university like California's great, great state university system um, Oops, we've lost you again. Um, Oh, okay. Hi, Barbara. So it's yeah, which has been so. Here we go. So, Mary, um, it's been suggested. Are you back? Yeah, it's been suggested. Yeah. Maybe if you turn off your camera. Yeah, that usually helps with the. This is the first time I've ever had this experience, so I'm I'm sort of flummoxed. I have a helper here who's helping me through this, and we've tried switching Wi-Fi networks. Does that help? You're, you're on now, uh, you would cut out just well, a second ago. Yeah, all right, let, let me try just going without video. It can't, you all have now seen me and know what I look like, so we can at least do that. Okay, I, let's try that. We'll try that anyway for a while. So um, I have literally uh, sat in the office of a governor who called the president of the UC system to ask for help in a big public policy question and um, heard on the other end of the line a discussion about how we might be able to convene a group of people who in turn could start working on this problem and you know maybe in a few years we would have answers and of course that was exactly what the governor did not want to hear he was in desperation at that particular moment this goes back to the state's energy crisis um, and it says a bunch of things. And one of the things it says is, of course, the president of UC doesn't necessarily have the power to commandeer faculty to do what uh, he or she uh, might 
think they should be doing. It also indicated that this particular individual, this was several UC presidents ago, um, didn't actually know who was around the various campuses who was working on all these problems and was going to have to go and ask several other underlings about, you know, who he could talk to to get to help the governor. So basically, the governor had picked the wrong person to call. He had assumed that he was dealing with somebody who, because of his title, could make stuff happen, and that didn't. Uh, that doesn't necessarily work. But my point in telling this slightly irreverent story here is that. I think what it also shows is that, you know, um, academia is in of itself a large institution and it's much more useful uh, both for the people who are trying to make things happen in a governmental context and the people in the university system who would like to be helping um, if they can manage to establish relationships at the level of the people who are actually doing the work on both sides of this equation. And so, you know, where I've seen successful um, relationships developed where work that was being done in the academy had really made, you know, an, a, a difference in what institutions were able to accomplish, it's been because over a period of years, um, you had developed a program where um, the, state agency was able to uh, help in terms of directing some support and funding for sure, which is always needed and there's never enough of, but also where in turn they were speaking enough, frequently enough to the people who were asking and working on the research questions that they could together understand what the priorities and needs were and be able to take results and quickly put them into processes that involve designing new regulations or setting air quality standards or whatever. Sometimes this can, you know, can lead to certain groups being favored in the decision-making process and others not. Uh, and, and sometimes the best ideas don't come forward in that kind of a situation and you're, you would be better off with a open competition, you know, for, for research awards. And, and we do do some of that in government and, and I think we should do more of it. But it's also true that um, if, in order to shape the views of the political establishment about what research even can help them figure out, you know, not just what should be done, but what are the questions that could even be addressed, um, you have to have the ability to have a conversation and that conversation has to happen across disciplinary lines because very seldom are you going to have enough people in the government arena who have the kind of science or technical backgrounds to really understand and interpret the work that's going on um, within the research community. So finding mechanisms to have regular conversations and not just wait for either a, uh, you know, a research grant proposal process uh, or a regulatory process where sometimes scientists can do, come in and speak um, and, do, and, and do when they are encouraged to do that, um, you know, can, can be the thing that really moves us forward. And, you know, we've been very fortunate in California that we've had so many people in different institutions who have been willing <clears throat> to really cultivate um, a knowledge of what the, what the public policy issues are and to get involved in um, helping to shape the, the solutions in those, in those areas. Um, so, you know, having the communication, having the ability to work jointly on projects together is hugely important. And I would just say one other thing before I uh, hopefully can stop for a minute and, you know, listen more to what others have on their minds. I would say that uh, sometimes taking a position in public, putting oneself into the public arena also um, is risky. If you do it too early in your career, you can be seen as you know not being sufficiently dedicated to research because you're spending too much time working on what might be seen as political matters. 
Uh, and I have seen uh, young colleagues when I was uh, working at the Institute of the Environment, one particular individual who chose to ignore this advice, but um, he did so knowing what he was doing and also you know, being somebody who was extraordinarily uh, capable. Um, you know, people said, D you don't have tenure yet. You shouldn't be spending so much time working on these interdisciplinary problems because they won't be, um, you, they won't be helpful to you and it may jeopardize your chances of, of, uh, of getting tenure. Um, and at the other end, sometimes you see people who are quite distinguished in their field and, you know, have freedom to work on what they want, still suffering from um, attacks um, in some cases, uh, very serious personal attacks if they trot into areas that are um, too controversial with powerful um, entities in our society, including big corporations. That's been particularly true in the chemical, uh, in the area of regulating uh, chemicals. But I think I'm going to stop, if I may, now, Barbara, and um, turn it to, to you. I don't know how you're handling the um, hand raising or chat or whatever, but um, I'd, I'd love to hear more from whatever you'd like me to focus on. Great. Well, so, so thanks, Mary. Um, so may I ask people uh, to put their questions in the chat? Uh, and we've got so many people on this call that I'm not going to be able to see raised hands uh, quite so so easily. So um, while, while people are putting their questions in the chat, let me let me lead off um, with a question here, uh, and that is, um, how do you suggest that uh, academics uh, establish long-term relationships that you mentioned are so important? So it's not just responding to to a crisis, but um, Back in the 70s, I, I think probably the state was small enough <laughs> or few enough people that uh, people like Jim could uh, form relationships with the RB and you and, and other people, Jerry Brown. Um, the state's gotten pretty big now. And, um, and so how would you suggest if, if people don't have those relationships, the best way is to build them? Is it working through our state representatives um, or... Uh, simply contacting people, for example, in the Air Resources Board, what, what would you suggest would be a, a good way to go? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I would suggest that people should come to work <laughs> for the state. Not everybody, of course, there aren't enough jobs and not everybody wants to do that anyway. But um, I do think that um, having the ability to have um, grad students or postdocs working with state agencies on specific problems um, can make a huge difference. Uh, once upon a time, um, UC Riverside had that kind of relationship with the Air Resources Board, and then they disbanded a program. They've now sort of reconstituted a lot of that capacity uh, through the um, uh, through this uh, CSERT entity that's part of the engineering school uh, there. And now with uh, ARB uh, building a big laboratory and Southern California headquarters uh, adjacent to the uh, UC Riverside campus, um, one of the arguments for doing that was that uh, we would have access to um, a whole bunch of people who could work as you know, everything from hourly student techs to, you know, people who would come and actually do research projects on, uh, on our, in our facilities and vice versa, where, where we would have access to their people. Um, by the way, uh, Riverside was chosen primarily because they had land that they were able to give for free to the state. And we had a, a limit on how far we could go as well as how much money could be spent. So it wasn't entirely an open process. But, um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that we can't also work with people at Irvine, for example, even though physically it may be a little bit more challenging to get from place to place. But thanks to the wonders of the internet when it's working, uh, not to mention the uh, rail system that's now being, you know, built out in Southern California, 
I think, um, you know, communications are going to be easier and um, it's going to be, you know, more, more possible to develop uh, joint projects using that, uh, using that laboratory facility as a base. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, Sonia, uh, who, who has reminded us that we should use the Q&A function, not the chat function to ask questions here. So if people could use that, that would be great. So Barbara, let me just mention, uh, since you asked the question about representatives, that um, you know state representatives can be just as clueless as the rest of us about what they could be doing that would actually help solve important public policy problems. And so one of the uh, functions that I feel like uh, ARB has been pretty good at over the years and which um, you know, I, I always think of Jim Pitts in this connection because he had developed quite the uh, expertise in giving tours to visiting dignitaries and helping them to understand not only what smog was and how the science was being done that showed how it was being caused, but also, you know, giving them opportunities to find ways that they could support uh, the work of, of reducing air pollution. Um, it is important to develop relationships with state legislators and their staffs um, who tend to stay around longer oftentimes than the members who were elected do, but um, to giving them, especially the ones who, you know, are from your particular area, uh, the ability to see how they might be able to actually craft a piece of legislation that could get adopted. That's like pure gold when it comes to, to working with the legislature. I know that um, uh, UC Irvine has been active over the years through the um, fuel cell collaborative in bringing people to Sacramento and sponsoring uh, occasions where they could brief them about what was going on in the fuel cell research. And, uh, you know, once a year is not enough by any means, but it's an illustration, I think, of how um, how you can build those kinds of uh, collaborations. Mm -hmm. So, so UC uh, has traditionally—I'm not sure they've done it in the last few years—but they've often organized um, uh, groups of faculty to go to Washington and uh, and visit with with legislators and. Uh, try to get on their radar screen in terms of issues they think that are important and they could help with. Uh, is that sort of thing uh, uh, desirable, for example, for the Sacramento uh, people? Sure. Um, you know, I had a, um, I had an assistant for a while, a policy advisor who was a former grad student, he had he didn't actually complete his PhD work because he got too involved in the public sector stuff, I might say, but it worked out okay for him because um, he now is in charge of a very large portfolio of funding from a, a foundation that gives in the climate area. So his, his career has hardly been uh, one of a failure and frustration. He's, it's, he's been able to do a lot about um, mainly clean vehicles and support for the program. But when I first met him, he was working in um, Washington for UC Davis uh, as a facilitator of communications between the university and, and Congress, and, and especially the California congressional delegation. But somebody had come up with the funding to hire this young man uh, to work full time in DC. Uh, he, you know, worked out of an office that uh, somebody else's office, I guess, not the not the normal UC. I don't think maybe he was actually in the in the UC office back there. But his sole job was to figure out how to translate. Um, research that was going on at Davis uh, about transportation policy for lawmakers. And um, he was, you know, he, he didn't change the world as a result of this, but he was successful at getting some specific ideas incorporated in bills and budgets that were moving through the process, raising the profile of the transportation Institute um, at UC with these members. And I think it, 
paid off in the long run, if only in our ability, that is CARB now, the Air Resources Board's ability to utilize some of those same ideas in our regulatory programs and gave us you know, the backdrop that, that we needed as well because we had legislators who understood what we were doing. So it had this really good ripple effect um, for not a very big investment. Um, I don't think uh, in general, you can have every single program or issue kind of covered that way, but the transportation folks have been, I think better at it than most because there's such a direct link between the research and knowing which agencies in government are actually the ones that are gonna be um, spending money and building stuff and making decisions. Mm -hmm. Great. So there's some questions here. Let me, uh, let me read the first one. Uh, lab scientists and doctors are successful at bench to bed, translating science to practice. In your experience, what would a lab to legislature translation require? A lobbyist's question mark? A science published in popular press? Question mark? Um, is there a simple mechanism for university researchers to make their findings available to make an impact on public policy? Um, it's a terrific question. And <clears throat> I wish I had a simple answer to it. Um, because I think it takes all of those things and maybe even more because you never know what exactly is going to work. So, you know, the, the most successful um, research to action um, scenario um, involves having the right person or the right study in the right place at the right time be seen by the right person. And how that all comes together is something you never exactly know. Um, most legislators and staffers, and for that matter, you know, most people in general don't read all that much, right? I mean, they, they read, even if they are, uh, you know, intel intelligent and in touch with the world, their information tends to come pretty filtered through what the press uh, is covering. And not many of them are, are reading sort of proceedings of the latest research you know, coming out of any institution. And that puts the researchers in the position sometimes of having to hire public relations agents you know, to get their work out there. Um, when that happens successfully, Usually it has been the result of a very serious conscious uh, communications strategy approach that was taken uh, by people who were supporting the research, either the funders or um, consumers of that research from the uh, academic, I mean, from the uh, advocacy or, or um, foundation world who have helped to support these uh, studies and then can take the work and package it in ways that they can dole it out, whether it's, you know, on the nightly news, if it seems exciting and interesting enough, or uh, in more sort of, you know, indirect and quiet ways. But um, it's, it is a serious, uh, hard effort, and it, and it requires a lot of work and a lot of expertise. Thank you. Um, so there's a question here as to, um, how has the recent complete dominance of state government by the Democrats helped and hindered clean air and climate change goals? Um, well, I it think- was, There's an uh, assumption built in there that it has. But <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I feel that um, support by the Democrats for climate change has become almost, um, you know, a, a cliche that Republicans oppose legislation about climate change and Democrats support it. Uh, that is less true in California than it was when there was a more robust competition between the parties because in the absence of a viable Republican party, what you have is Democrats sort of taking on the role of skeptics or um, people who don't think that government should be doing anything to promote uh, electric vehicles or anything that might be seen as harmful to the interests of the, of the uh, oil and gas industry. And so it doesn't matter that they're Democrats and will vote for 
Democrats on, you know, Democratic leadership on many issues, they're still going to be as hard to get on board with any, uh, you know, anything that's at all difficult by way of solutions, and in some ways uh, more so uh, than than Republicans were. Uh, so I, I don't like the idea of single party domination in the legislature, although if, you know, if that's what happens, you have to try to learn to deal with it. But um, as, we, as we have seen in recent years, um, the democratic dominance has not uh, automatically led to some of the kinds of progressive legislation around land use, transportation planning and policy uh, that people might have thought it would when, if you just drew a bright line between Democrats and Republicans on these issues. Where there's competition, at least sometimes you have Republicans deciding that they're going to come up with solutions of their own. And sometimes those solutions are um, different than what Democrats might have decided they wanted. Sometimes they can actually work together and craft solutions that meet the needs of, of uh, different groups. And that's really when you have the most robust and sustainable solutions. Thank you. Uh, so uh, another question here, what's your opinion on the potential for ongoing US collaboration with China on lowering emissions? I'm hopeful and moderately optimistic, I would say hopeful because you have to be hopeful. Uh, we, we have to have China's involvement and uh, particularly given China's ambitions to be influential around the world. Um, it's very important that we be able to engage with them directly, that we can compete, uh, but also um, ultimately be able to be working towards the same, same goals. Um, and I'm moderately optimistic because I've seen over the past couple of years that despite, you know, the four years of um, sort of belligerent rhetoric uh, under the Trump administration and what seemed to be some pretty um, progressive moves, I guess, on the part of China um, in other areas, especially of human rights, that um, when it comes to climate, we've been able to continue talking. And I'm now, by we, I mean the state of California uh, with the leading, uh, folks in China who work on climate change, uh, the uh, California Climate, California China Climate Institute, which is based at uh, Berkeley, but is, uh, is system wide, is an example, maybe the only example of a functioning uh, bi-national institution where um, solutions continue to be discussed and, and, and the, now that um, under Biden, there seems to be more openness for uh, once COVID travel restrictions are, are eased, more openness for exchanges and uh, joint conferences. And, and so uh, I, I feel like there's a, there's a reasonable uh, hope that we will be able to work together on some of the policy, uh, policy solutions that would really benefit from having um, both of our countries involved. Mm -hmm. So, so given your, uh, you know, experience uh, starting back with air quality and air pollution, uh, when climate change really wasn't so much on our radar screen, except for a, a few folks, uh, can can you comment? You know, we we thought back in the seventies that it seemed like cleaning up the air was going to be almost impossible, and and uh, um, you know, it, it it's worked by and large. Uh, but certainly a lot of barriers were seen at the time, and there were a lot of barriers. Uh, what do you see with climate change and trying to address climate change in terms of similarities um, with the challenges of addressing it, uh, kind of in light of what you know about the, air, the history of air quality and addressing uh, it over the years? Sure. <clears throat> well, the similarities are relatively easy to draw because the the sources that we're looking at, which is combustion of fossil fuels, are 
basically the same. <laughs> there, it's more complicated with climate change, of course, and there are other contributing factors, other, other chemical constituents and so forth. But the bulk of the problem was and remains that we keep on you know, burning stuff that has carbon in it, as well as other constituents that cause ground level air pollution, and that we have to come up with ways that uh, will squeeze more and more of this stuff out of the system, including probably um, increasingly ability to capture carbon dioxide that's already in the air and to um, find ways to, uh, to reduce it uh, or, and or uh, reuse it. So um, that's the similar similarity side. I think the, the differences of course are that because um, all of these activities that produce CO2 are so uh, embedded throughout our society, um, it requires uh, oftentimes, I would say, more multifaceted uh, solutions, not just a simple technology approach to get things to happen. And so on the policy side, things like the low carbon fuel standard, where you have a regulation that requires the suppliers of transportation fuels to reduce the amount of carbon in their overall uh, product sales. So it's like, a, it's like a, a comprehensive reduction mandate, which is enforceable. You have a financial incentive because um, companies can buy credits from uh, those who have invented and are able to produce um, fuels that are much, much cleaner on a life cycle basis. Uh, you have uh, a very capable um, uh, set of players on the corporate side, the, the companies that actually develop and produce fuels, uh, which have very high level of um, uh, competence and expertise in how to produce fuels. Um, and you have a political establishment that um, was willing, although sometimes under uh, grave difficulties to enforce the standards and to, to make sure that the incentive continued to be there to comply with this requirement. And you really had to have all those things. Now, we've been able to do that in California with considerable success because we've had a succession of leaders uh, who've been uh, willing to back up the agencies and the agencies themselves have been well informed by scientists when they created these programs, uh, when they created the, in this case, the low carbon fuel standards so that you had a policy that made sense even though it was new and risky and you had ability to comply and you had politicians who despite resistance, enormous resistance in many cases on the part of the oil industry uh, were willing to back up ARB in, in implementing that program. And you know, even so, there were a number of points along the way where the whole thing nearly crashed. Now it's considered so much of a success that it's being looked at as a potential tool for the federal government to use uh, in, in the new approach towards climate change. So um, you know, it's uh, ultimately we were able to uh, to prevail, but this has been, you know, this process has been in the works for, you know, more than a decade before we got to the point where we're now reasonably sure that it's going to succeed and that we're going to be able to to keep it going. Um, so the need for patience, <laughs> ambition and zeal, but also patience when things aren't quite all cooked um, makes this hard to do. So, so related to that is um, is a, is a question of of collective action in a sense as well. Um, so, with with air pollution, I remember you know Jim always said, well, you know, if you couldn't see it and your eyes weren't watering and your lungs weren't hurting, then there wouldn't have been a lot of incentive uh, for people to get upset and put pressure on their on their legislators and so on. Um, and climate change, although we're starting to see far more impacts earlier than we ever thought we would, uh, still it's not impacting people sort of in the face as it was with air quality. 
Uh, and, and so um, do you have any thoughts about how you uh, really uh, get the public on board um, to make changes in lifestyle? Because you know, this, this is going to require very major changes um, by everybody. Uh, do you have any comments on, on how we go about doing that? Well, I think <clears throat> probably we don't focus initially on the general public and telling them about how their lifestyle is going to have to change, because I think that automatically sets off a reaction of fear, concern, which frankly may not be uh, necessary and certainly can be counterproductive. I say that because I'll take the example you said um, and I don't disagree with you that most people are not on a day-to-day -day experiencing pain uh, from, uh, from global warming. Probably the, the most you can say is that over a sustained period of time, if the temperatures get really high, it, it, you can see and feel the misery you know, throughout the whole area and not just uh, you know, on a short-term basis. But, the but here is that this is one instance where the politicians are experiencing the pain more than the vast majority of uh, Californians. And that has to do with the wildfires. Um, simply put, while Southern California has been spared the worst of it over the last few years, you know, there are literally whole towns in Northern California that have been wiped out and huge swaths of our uh, national lands that have been um, dramatically impacted. But even more so from the politician's perspective, um, uh, you know, aside from the smoke that blankets whole areas and sends people to the hospital, but again, it, it goes away after a short period of time, it's using up the budget. It's spending, it's costing billions of dollars to fight these fires. And they can't just be left to burn because the impacts on people are too uh, widespread and, and too serious. So uh, you have the legislature now much more alert to the need to do a better job of um, uh, finding alternatives to uh, these kind of catastrophic fires. And some of that has to do with better forest management. And some of it has to do with addressing the, um, the need to keep global warming from escalating at the rate that it would be if we weren't taking serious action. And the fact that we can find solutions that do both of those things at the same time is what gives me the hope that you can rally the public behind these kinds of um, solutions without having to say, you're, you know, we're going to take away your pickup truck and you're only going to be allowed to drive, drive something with a battery in it. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, one last question here, which I hope I'm interpreting correctly. Um, are, are there climate change solutions that make a real difference? Um, uh, so either individual behaviors, government regulation, new technology, uh, what do you think makes a really significant difference or can make a really significant difference? First of all, I'm a believer in a portfolio approach, which is what we adopted in California, where we have combined together um, sector specific regulations uh, incentives that are direct incentives to do things like turn over the fleet um, and a market-based program that caps and uh, creates an allowance system where you have tradable allowances. You also have billions of dollars of revenue coming to the state that can be reinvested in uh, programs that help some of our poorest, most disadvantaged communities that deal with uh, problems of air pollution and health and uh, poor solutions to poor urban planning, as well as also uh, getting at some of the fundamental uh, some of the fundamental causes of, of climate change as well. So I, I think the, the solutions in the sense of coming up with alternatives may be relatively clear cut. Stop burning anything, right? That's that's a solution. But to get to that you have to employ a multitude of different policy approaches. And then one, one very last question here that um, you just touched on here. Um, so what do you think the most significant challenges are 
to protecting disadvantaged communities and vulnerable people in California from climate change. You know, it's all the built-in inequities in our in our society um, have their own repercussions on the environmental side as well. Um, there's a mounting body of evidence, which is, you know, it's pretty intuitively uh, right, even if you didn't have the data, but we do, uh, that show that people who are living in communities that are predominantly uh, or high in uh, unemployment and um, people uh, who uh, have not finished school and who are, um, you know, not who are exposed to uh, pollution from, you know, next door <laughs> neighbor neighborhood sources that that uh, you know impact them directly. Uh, also, uh, have a harder time getting to a hospital if they're having an asthma attack, have a harder time, you know, uh, getting access to uh, high quality transportation. You know, it's just, these things are cumulative. Um, and so uh, the, the challenge of course is not to throw up our hands, but to figure out how to design solutions that can maybe disproportionately improve the quality of life in the most severely impacted areas. And that in part uh, is a matter of just focusing funds. Uh, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as we're seeing in California with the AB um, 617 program that you referenced at the very beginning, um, you have to find ways to allow, encourage, empower uh, individuals and groups in communities that have historically been at the bottom of the totem pole to participate in crafting the solutions themselves. Because even with the best of you know, benevolent uh, government, uh, it's not the same in a democratic society as having um, a sense that your community, you yourself, uh, can play a role in helping to solve these problems and that you have a voice and that it's being listened to. Well, I think uh, time is up here. Maybe you could turn your camera back on and we can give you a, a, a virtual round of applause here. We re really appreciate you sharing your time and wisdom, Mary. Well, and, thanks, Barbara. Yeah, thanks. no, it's, it's, it's been absolutely wonderful. I know it's really appreciated by everybody. And uh, so we'll look forward to talking again soon. Enjoy being with you, thanks. And uh, let me for the group announce that there is uh, the next seminar is going to be on June 17th by Destiny Nock, who's a leader in an energy justice and equitable energy transitions. And so that will be um, the STS seminar next month. And it'll, it's on the uh, website. There. So again, so, thank, thanks so much, Mary. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm sure I can help build up to the next one. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you've given us a lot to think about. And uh, We've got a very enthusiastic group here and you've really provided us with a lot of food for thought. That's great. All right, see you all, I hope. Thanks so bye. much. Okay, bye.